Money and misogyny at Goldman Sachs from a woman who achieved the coveted managing director title at the best firm on Wall Street, a position achieved by only the top 8% at the firm. We're talking truth to power today on Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Jamie Fior Higgins worked for 20 years at Goldman Sachs. She was the highest ranking woman in her department. Currently, she's a trained coach working with teens to hone their leadership skills with high school and college graduates as they begin their careers with professionals as they navigate the workforce and those in midlife looking to reinvent themselves. That's a big menu. And her new book, sure to generate some controversy, it already is, Bully Market, My Story of Money and Misogyny at Goldman Sachs. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's our honor. Now, it's a tough take on Goldman. Um, I imagine you're not too popular there right now. Other than the official comments that they've made with some of the press, I haven't heard from them. I have to say, you know, it's interesting. I spent close to 20 years living and dying by what Goldman Sachs thought of me. And okay. it feels really good to be in a position where I'm just giving people my honest experiences and not really caring what their reaction is going to be. I read that coming out of, I think, the New Yorker article or your book, that they said we they basically tried to discredit you by saying it was composite anonymity. But I'm thinking to myself, they made you a managing director and only 8% people get there. So did they screw that up? Or, you know, is it just out there to... Uh... Well, I would just say, I feel like I wrote the book in a really respectful and responsible manner. It's not my intention to shame people, you know, run people's, yeah. you know, names through the mud. It's more of an account of what happens at large, powerful organizations. Let me ask you... My this. setting happens to be Goldman, but it could happen anywhere. The underlying motivation... Um... Was it courage? Was it anger? What's What was the driving force? So it was really interesting. I left the firm in 2016 and I was depressed. <laughs> Working at Goldman was the anchor that tethered me to the world. And without it, I was just kind of floating in the breeze. I used to say to my husband almost every day over coffee those first few months, did I really do it? Did I really walk away? Did I really have the guts? Because it was something I had talked about and hadn't done it. And I was really fortunate that I was able to take a break and spend some time with my kids, which I hadn't had the chance to do. My youngest was an infant. And so I started volunteering at the local school. And a lot of these women were like, oh, wait, who are you? We haven't seen you, you know? And I would say, oh yeah, I used to work at Goldman Sachs. Oh, well, how come you don't work there anymore? And so I would just start giving them anecdotes. I was, what was most recently on my mind then was the mooing incident when I went to go pump for my kids. And, you know, I used to get mooed at and their reaction was incredulous. And don't get me wrong, on some level, when I left, I knew it was a toxic environment, but then seeing their reaction made it even more so. And then throughout that year, people were coming forward and talking about things that were happening in their workplaces. I found that there was an environment that was really encouraging people to tell their stories. And so I always was a writer. I always kept journals about just my thoughts and feelings and my experiences so I decided to expand on them and put them to paper. And I'm glad I did because as I wrote them, I really kind of saw it from a really 30,000 foot perspective and really just how organizations do this to people the way, because, you know, I just wasn't a victim of the toxicity. I perpetuated it. So it really helped me frame my experiences. And so I'm writing it because I want to credentialize what happened. It's also a way for me to make a bit of amends to all those women I didn't stand up for. Yeah. And also to sh just shine light on how we need to do better in our workplaces for everyone. Yeah, you know, it, it, you almost get a sense that it's almost a cult-like environment because you kept acquiescing. You know, when they said, take the pictures off your desk, you know, this isn't a mama's place, you know, on and on and on. And you just... You know, you just did it. Let me let's talk about starting off with Goldman on their secret sauce. They've got a great reputation, long term greedy, client interest first, meritocracy. What's your thoughts on that? Is it true? So 
I always say when I first interviewed at Goldman, the tagline was minds wide open. We want various backgrounds. We want perspectives. We want to hear from you. And it couldn't have been further from the truth. So I feel like in my experience, there is um, a bit of a smoke and mirrors, a bit of a veneer between the fancy talking points of the executive office to the day to day. So, for example, generous maternity leave packages that get on the best places for working women to work, but you're dialing in every day. You know, lactation rooms with state-of-the-art pumps and consultants, but then you're told not to use them. So, yeah, I think there's a big, big gap between what they want it to be and what it truly is. What in your mind is the best of Goldman in your terms? I mean, super smart, super savvy, incredibly hardworking. I have never seen people who were so intelligent, who were really able to get the most value out of any opportunity. And that's both for the P&L of the firm and also for the benefit of the clients. So they really do bring a lot of the best and brightest people. And the irony is, you know, among all those best and brightest people, there's all that assimilation happening and that all kind of towing the party line. Let me ask you this. Um, I think in the New Yorker inter- interview, I read this that you said driven by a shallow profit motive. And I sometimes translate that into, is this a misallocation of our best resources to be doing this stuff? And do they all hate it behind the scenes? It's the money they can't leave? At Goldman, they hire such incredibly smart and sharp people. And yeah, I mean, why don't we get them all and put them in a lab and cure cancer for Pete's sake? You know? Uh, So yeah, absolutely. But the money is unprecedented. I mean, and I just know for myself and the irony for me, I'm not even someone who ever lived the lifestyle. You know, for me, the money was never about the shoes or the bags or the big, you know, it was about providing for my family of origin, providing for the family I was creating. But, you know, when those big paydays are dangled in front of your face like a carrot. It's really, really hard to walk away. So, in yeah. Fact, that leads to what I wanted to ask you, too, on this is you didn't really ever want to go to this kind of a job. Um, and your parents kind of pushed you. So is part of your reaction your own not wanting to be there from the beginning anyway? I will tell you, no, I did not. I wanted to have a more altruistic career for sure. However, um, I'm incredibly driven. And if there's one thing about my background, for better or for worse, I'm the person who's the underdog who likes to prove people wrong. Yeah. And I was a math major, so I did have a head for math. So was finance my passion? Absolutely not. But I really do feel I had the smarts to be successful there, and I was. And I feel like if the environment had been more welcoming and accepting of different experiences, different backgrounds, different interests, you know, it would have been a much more pleasant experience. So just because it's not what I wanted from the start, I went in there and I just wanted to, you know, knock the cover off the ball. And I did. And you did. did. And really the, you know, the, the real bigger themes of misogyny and harassment didn't really happen until I was older. I mean, listen, I was constantly enduring the white noise of it, the nonsense on the desk and stuff, but really the stakes weren't raised for me until there was a lot of money on the table for me to leave. It's almost as if they know they have you with those big payouts. Let me ask you this. Um, You left in 2016, which is essentially before the hashtag Me Too era. So is, is, is it a little out of date in that way? Is, do you think Goldman's different or not? So, yeah, you would like to think so. But my personal d- DMs on all my social media tells a very different story. So I can tell you the dozens and dozens of messages I've gotten from people, men, women, at Goldman, on Wall Street, on private equity. So listen, do I think... Me Too and other social justice movements have improved things? Absolutely. Do I think if I had been 
assaulted today and I went to my manager, I would like to think that guy would have been out of that building so fast his head would be spinning. Yes. However, I still think that careers are being killed, maybe not through blunt force trauma, but through the death of a thousand paper cuts. The slow erosions of opportunity, I think deals are still getting done on the golf courses. I think there's still these bro clubs going on. And the feedback I've been getting from women currently in the workforce attest to that very same fact. So do I think it's helped? Yes. Do I think that big organizations are very good at kind of keeping the dark sun under wraps? Yes. And do I think we could be doing better? Yes. You're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Please consider my book, Madoff Talks, uncovering the untold story of the most notorious Ponzi scheme in history now being made into a documentary by Netflix. Back with Jamie coming right up. Would you like to host your own radio program or podcast? Park City Productions 06604 is a Bridgeport, Connecticut-based radio broadcast solutions company. Follow us on Instagram. Like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's Park City Productions 06604. Call us at 203-522-8801. We're back with Jamie Fjord Higgins, a former managing director at Goldman Sachs. Um, Talk a little bit about what the culture uh, that you came from. You came from a non-wealthy background. Um, you had this drive from medical issues you're talking about, but your first year salary with bonus was 135000 which blew your family right out of the water, right? Yeah, yeah. And there was a mixture of pride and a mixture of shame with that. Like, they, of course, were so proud of me, and I felt like we're one big team. But I couldn't help but think, gosh, like my parents at the time, they were in their late 50s. They were at, like, the peak of their careers. So there was a lot of shame with that money because I knew how hard they worked. And so I knew they were proud of me, but it definitely was a complicated feeling to have. And I know what women have to go through. My wife's father um, was a blue collar worker. She never felt she could tell him what her salary was Mm. because he would be hurt or, or whatever, even though, you know, you know, it's, there's no reason for that. But it's kind of interesting what you have to sort of uh, uh, sort of deal with. But we have to your parents gave you great support. You did well at Bryn Mawr. And um, I'm still blown away, by the way, that you had to have something like 78 interviews to get into Goldman. Yeah, it was about the folks with connections got in the back door. Yeah, it was about 40 interviews over the course of like five days. I mean, it was over the course of months and five days, but I'll never forget. Yeah. When this woman was like, oh, I had five. It's like, what? I know. These guys on the desk, the trading desk, um, isn't it? Is it obvious for the folks at Goldman who these are? Now I know you put some composite together. How did go ahead on that? Yeah. So, like I said earlier, I didn't want to kind of signal signal anyone out. So names have been changed. Characters are composites. So is the do I think people? I I don't think anyone reading the book is going to be like, oh, my gosh, X, Y, Z person is that because inside inside Goldman. Correct. Because the sentiment is so prevalent that, you know, the jokes are just the banter on the desk that everyone um, and everyone kind of participates. So, like I said, it's kind of like a white noise when they're building macros about what a woman's breast size is and leg length. I mean, it's just kind of. It's just kind of something that everyone kind of participated in. Just and they, the nonsense. They gave out names, right? You were Sister Jamie, but there was Slut Melissa. I mean, these neither of them are very uh, endearing. Yeah, and, and you know, that's what I, I think is so fascinating. At Goldman, we were all almost like posable dolls in this man's world. So, like, there was another woman who was, a at, at that time when I was junior, I was not married, had no kids. She was an active mother. And so they called her mom. You know, she was the mom and I was the non and who was the slut. And it's like, it was such narrow definitions for us where the men were all these multifaceted people. You know, um, uh, obviously your achievements speak for themselves, but folks 
that you went over, older lying men, basically said that you were promoted because of your vagina. How was that to deal with? Well, it was so fascinating to me because when I got promoted, it was almost like people were like, Jamie, because I was a little busy bee in the corner. And that promotion really signaled a threat. And then the clause came out. And the most easy way to, I guess at the time, complain about me was like pointing out my gender. And so it's just kind of a low blow that you would have. Talk about me being assaulted at work, essentially. So I had recently become a manager. So this was a really exciting thing. This is where I was told, you know, you only got it because you're a woman, because you have a vagina. And so I really wanted to do well. This was my first foray in. You are on track to be something at Goldman. I was a VP. And a VP is respectable, but there are a lot of VPs at Goldman. And that's kind of where a lot of people cap out. And then it's, okay, you're on MD track. And so my first job was managing this team. And one of the gentlemen that worked for me, he was very frustrated that I was his manager because he had once been a manager. So we had, I was usurping him and his wife started calling the desk because claiming that he was having an affair with a client. I had heard about it. It was the worst kept secret, but I had nothing to prove. And it, I wasn't about to, you know, bring it up to manager because I wasn't even sure if it was just gossip, but she kept calling and calling and my heart broke for her. Um, and, you know, that kind of social worker side of me kind of got sucked in and I was trying to talk to her. Then I said, you know what, this is just getting too disruptive. So I talked to my boss. He said, well, we're not getting rid of him. Why don't you just get him off the client? Because then there won't be a conflict of interest. Now, technically, you're not supposed to be having an affair, you know, anything. But okay. in order to be gracious, I didn't want to just signal him out with this client. I mixed up all the coverage. So it didn't look like I was signaling him out. And the opportunity he was losing, he was getting another big client in his place. And so I pulled him aside at the end of the workday because you always send bad messages at the end of the workday. So if anyone has a scene, nobody knows. And I pulled him aside. I said, listen, we, we mixed up coverage and, you know, I'm, I want to kind of mix things up and have people get to know other clients. He crumpled the paper. I got up because, you know, I kind of sensed this and he pushed me against the wall by the throat, told me he was going to rip my effing face off and, you know, scared I was petrified. I was petrified. I talked him off the ledge. <laughs> he he like settled. He was he was like crimson. He like released me, walked out the door. It was the end of the day. Nobody was there. I of course like held it together until I got in my car, called my husband hysterical. And then we said, well, what are we gonna do about it? I said, I have to say something. The next day, I pulled my manager aside. I told him what happened. He advised me that there are groups to report to this at Goldman, but that they weren't getting rid of him because he was a scratch golfer. And he got them access to all the golf courses all around. And so they weren't going to get rid of him. So imagine how hard it was going to be for me to continue to manage him after I reported him. And reminding me that they had big things in store for me. And this was my first job as a manager. And so I shut up. You know, we talked about my head for numbers and we talked about my work ethic, but I was really good at shutting up. The, um, you were also sexually assaulted. Um, how did that feel when you're at business meetings with people that are either above you or under you doing that? Always propositioning, always propositioning, especially at conferences, because now you're away from home, you're sleeping on the premises, you know, uh, spouses aren't around, and it, the, the propositions were often, it wasn't just me, it was like all the women, and it's a double-fold whammy, because number one, you're propositioned, which is uncomfortable, and so you have to endure that. And then you have to endure the potential issues the next day after you pass and you pray to God, they don't remember because then it's like, okay, so not only, but now you rejected me. So, you know, I have it in for you now too. 
So you almost have to pay twice. All right, I want to shift a little bit now. Uh, next next segment, we'll uh, talk more with Jamie. We'll talk about the impact on his spouse, too. You're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Jamie Fior Higgins, the new book is Bully Market, My Story of Money Managers and Misogyny at Goldman Sachs. Um, I want to ask you uh, uh, first... The um, a little bit about uh, about your job now because uh, we haven't focused on that. And um, I find it uh, first of all, I love the word hypothecate, and I'm one of the only guys I know outside of Austin who actually knows what that means. Yes. But I, I, it, when you explain it briefly and how big it was, but also the inherent conflict of interests that the firms face um, in so many different positions. Go ahead. Yeah, so what we did, uh, we lent out securities to hedge funds who wanted to short them. And we do that in a couple of ways. Some we actually borrow. And then, as you point out, the firm can rehypothecate shares. This is just a common practice. If people run margin, you are allowed to use their collateral. The user securities as collateral. And in this case, the collateral is um, securities that are being lent to hedge funds. So yeah, so there's a lot of situations where we have long holder shares that are being used to cover other client short positions. Those are the ones we don't need to source out of house. If you're uh, borrowing a security from a customer, you're paying them an interest rate in that case, and then you're lending it out at a much bigger spread. So the first customer is kind of getting screwed a little bit. Well, it's interesting because there is no marketplace for what a stock borrow costs. It's all kind of this opaque thing. So yeah, the, listen, the savvier of the lender you are, the more value you get from the security. But there are a lot of people out there, they don't even know their securities are being lent, right? Yeah. And so, you know, they might be at a local broker and they're running margin and their securities are being lent. And so not only are those small brokers not charging enough, but the beneficial owners might not even be earning a dime on it because they're getting rehypothecated. So there's also there's also there's also like a double thing there in terms of if you're long a hard to borrow, you should be able to get some value in that too. It seems that, that and, and this you had a huge portfolio, I think ninety six billion dollars. So it's a big deal. Did you feel you were too narrow? I mean, why didn't you? Why didn't they give you more exposure to other divisions, for instance? So at Goldman Sachs, it's a very big firm with a lot of different divisions, but it's fairly siloed. Like you stay in your world for the most part. So certainly as I mean, when I was hired, I was hired for a specific seat. Some firms, I feel like JP might do it. You get hired as an analyst and then you rotate a couple of years and decide where you want to be. Not so at Goldman, you're hired in that seat. There is some opportunity for movement at the analyst level, at the associate level. Once you're a VP, you're pretty much in that business. Maybe there's opportunities within the like other areas that are right adjacent, but there's not a lot of movement across divisions or across the firm. Is there a huge cultural difference between bankers and traders? I believe so, yes. So, you know, listen, my only experience is in like security, sales and trading. I do know I had interactions with other people in um, investment management and in, you know, GSAM and stuff. And they definitely had different experiences, investment research as well. I think it has a lot to do with the stakes of the business. The higher stakes, the riskier, I think it kind of comes out a little bit more. So let's talk now about the impact on the family and the spouses. And, and uh, to start with, you get a sense there's got to be some subconscious turmoil. Your husband f- gives up a career, in a sense, because of the money you're making to take care of the kids. In the meantime, you're taking care of the money and not getting the kids. It's, it, how, you know, how do you, you know, both of you, in other words, are in, in a dilemma, basically. Yeah, we were both miserable. Yeah, and yeah. so, you know, it was so hard because he, we both wanted flexibility and the ability to work. For my job, I had zero flexibility. So therefore he had to have 
the majority of the flexibility. So we had this unbalanced thing and it's not what either of us wanted to do. So a lot of resentment built. So for me, you know, I felt like I was doing everything for my kids. And then when I would be able to come home at night, they wouldn't even go to me. I mean, they were like toddlers then, but they just weren't used to me and they hadn't seen me all week. And oh, it just broke my heart because all the headache and heartache was for them. And like, I wasn't even getting any of like the goodies. I mean, listen, I don't blame them. They were little, they didn't know any better. It built resentment on my end. For Dan, I was never around. It built resentment on his end. We both made really bad choices. And we finally realized, you know what? Like we both are using these unhealthy coping mechanisms to deal and to escape. And, you know, really we just needed to escape from Goldman and Wall Street. Um. One of the escapes that you went down the route was having an affair with a guy in the office, um, which you realized that it was a pure escape. Um, talk about that and the impact on Dan. And how did you rebuild a trust? Yeah, well, it's funny. And I'm, I'm dating myself here. You might get the reference, but I know a lot of people want it. It was kind of my Calgon take me away moment. I was working my butt off. I was getting up at, you know, my girlfriend used to call it Oh Dark Hundred. I used to wake (laughs) up in the pitch black, you know, come home in the pitch black, working my tail off. It was super hard for me to stay competitive because, you know, the guys were, you know, either didn't have kids or didn't go home at night. They were able to work all night late. I was failing at home because my kids didn't even recognize me. My husband, I just felt like I couldn't, I wasn't a good mother. I wasn't a good spouse. I wasn't a good employee. And here's this colleague, 20 years, my senior empty nester. And he'd be like, and he was very helpful in my career. Like got me exposure, helped me get promoted, really wanted what's best for me. And so, you know, we would go out to dinner and, and, you know, we, and he would just, He would fill up my bucket, you know, and tell me how great I was and what a good employee I was and, you know, how I I, I make it look so easy and stuff. And I really just melted because I just wanted someone to tell me I wasn't screwing anything up. At that point in my life, it was terribly attractive, terribly attractive. You know, I would come home at night. My husband would be cranky. The kids wouldn't want to talk to me or I could go out to this beautiful dinner and share a bottle of wine and talk about life. I just, it was just a temptation. I wasn't strong enough to refuse. How did you rebuild the trust? When I finally realized like, wow, this is it. I really got to the point where, and I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say it. I'm embarrassed to say it. It, it. it took a while before I realized, wow, I could actually like get a divorce. And what would that really look like? And what would my life look like afterwards? And why am I even at Goldman to begin with? It's because of them. And so my husband was so gracious because he really understood it was a coping mechanism, just like my Xanax was, just like my wine habit at night was. He was really able to see it. Listen, it was through the help of a therapist who really made it clear because Jamie Fiore from 1998, Sister Jamie having an affair? I know, I know. Sister Jamie? Like, what? What? So through the help of our therapist was really able to see that it had nothing to do with him. It had to do with me just being so strung out. And so we really knocked down the marriage and rebuilt it. And I have to say, we've been married 18 years now. And I feel like most people, if you've lasted that long, you've got something in the rear view mirror. Let me and ask you this. For, let, me, let me ask you this. Um, so you and Dan are planning for eons and eons, years and years that you're going to retire uh, and you're going to get out. And I love the spreadsheet you built for, with savings, which is very impressive. So now you guys did it. Did it work like you thought? Goldman, in my experience, has a scarcity mindset, which constantly leads to paranoia. There's never enough money. There's never enough time. There's never enough opportunity. It was like... They made me feel, I really felt that once I left, I would never make a dime again. So it was almost like, hey, Jamie, we're sending you to the desert without food for the rest of your life. Here's your all-you-can-eat money buffet. Shove it as much as you can so you can last. That was a lie. That was a lie I told myself. That was a lie that I believed. 
it did work out. Listen, did I plan? Was I very fortunate? A hundred percent. I would have been okay if I had left years before. Because there's and, abundance know, of opportunity in this world to make money. Goldman Sachs is not the only place. Yeah, it's amazing to me the way they break you down that way and tell you you're nothing without Goldman Sachs, even though they hire the best uh, uh, the best people in the world. And, and, you know, to give people a sense, you know, they're saying, why the hell didn't she leave? You were getting bonuses of well over a million bucks. True? Yeah, true. And it was that's, like literally... It's real money. It's real money. And so, you know... Kind of talking earlier about, you know, my family and making more than people. Every morning, I would drive past the Jordash factory in Jersey City every morning at 5 a.m. And I would see these people walking with their paper bags for their shift. I was like, what are you complaining about? How bad is it? And it's amazing what people will do for money. It's a, They're so good at dangling that carrot. And not only is it dangled yearly with your bonus, but then there's all the vesting schedules and the clawbacks. So it just kind of keeps you constantly coming for more. When you get the managing director title, they take money away from you, from your salary at the same time. It is amazing. We'll be right back for our final second uh, segment with Jamie. We'll talk about how to fix it, maybe. Jamie Fior Higgins, who walked away from Goldman Sachs. Okay, we've talked about all these issues. How do we fix the misogynistic culture issues in your mind from your experience? I think first, the disconnect needs to be bridged between the fancy talking points and what happens in the day to day. So you read all the press releases, all the fringe benefits, it's awesome. But it actually needs to translate. Right now, it's like a bad game of telephone that I play with my kids at the dinner table. So, you know, it's really making sure the day-to-day management is walking the talk of the executive office. I think that a lot of times, people who are considered thought leaders, who run big P&Ls, are kind of set it and forget it. You know, at Goldman... They have compliance officers who are always making sure, you know, we're doing the right thing. Yeah. Well, why don't we have people who are policing for inappropriate business practices? And looking back, I kind of don't blame him. The guy who ratted me out from HR wanted a job on the money side. Why are they even, why don't we just have separate HR companies that contract in and, mm-hmm. you know, aren't motivated by the PL of their firms? You know, also, we need better diversity. So Goldman hires 50% women, which is awesome. They have goals for BIPOC as well. Are we tracking them as they age in the firm? You can't just bring them at the door. You got to get them to stay. So is there good support for these people at every aspect of their career? Why doesn't Goldman have a goal to make 50% of managing directors women? I was going to say, if they're hiring 50% women, they still have very few partners, right? I think it's like 18%, 17%. So why don't we make that goal? Why don't we make that a goal? I mean, listen, firms like Goldman Sachs are run by metrics. They know how to slice and dice everything. So to me, you can't just bring them in. You have to get them to stay. And it's that diversity at the senior level, which will help permeate on down. Now, the the current chairman, uh, David uh, Solomon, and obviously you, you didn't work under him, are they are they sincere about all this? I'd like to think so. I'd like to think they are. I'd like to think that when they pen these things, they really believe it. The point is, though, you have to make sure it's like it's like the the playground, right? You got to have make sure that people are on the playground to make sure the day to day that kids aren't getting beaten up. The principal can't stay locked in their office. They got to be walking the floors. So to me, yeah, I like to believe that they're, they they write these things, they want them to happen. But the point is, they have to be there. They have to be walking the floors. They have to make sure it's happening. That's how you, that's how you make sure that people are walking the talk. And when there's bad actors, they got to be managed out. I don't care how much they make for the firm. I don't care how innovative they are. The world is filled with smart, sharp people. It's harder to get into Goldman than to get into Harvard. Yeah, no. You can get smart, sharp people who are decent individuals. There's enough of us in the world. 
Let me ask you this now. We all know the old boys network, the scratch golfer and everything. Let's go over to the women's network. You you worked in there. You were you ran trainee internship programs, recruiting. Are the women there from yourself on down building this kind of mentorship nat- uh, nature to basically combat against the old boy network? Or is the culture inhibiting that? I think kind of like we discussed with the scarcity mindset of money, there's a scarcity mindset for opportunity for women. In my experience, it was a zero sum game. If I did well, they had to lose. It was as if there were so few spots at the table for us that if you brought a woman up, you might be asked to go. Really? So, you know, which, which I find so ironic because you know, it's a zero sum game for the women where one has to win for the other lose, but all the men are winning together. You know, I, I'll never forget going to a women's network event, which should have been so empowering. And all the women were around the three men in the room because they were the partners. We need to do better in terms, because I know for myself, I did not stand up for women when I could. So it's not only about having a presence at the table, It's having a presence at the table and not feeling like you have to toe the party line. So not only do you need diversity in terms of representation, you need diversity of thought. Because yes, I was a woman who was a managing director of Goldman Sachs, which was good. I was just the sound box for the guy in the office. So was I really bringing my diverse experiences and sensibilities? No, that needs to change. Tell us about what you're doing now. After I left Goldman and I started writing my book, I also got trained as a leadership coach, which has been amazing because I feel like it kind of really scratches that social work itch from 20 years ago, but marries my real life experience. I love working with my clients. And as you said earlier, they run the gamut of age and experience, but really help them decide what kind of career they want making sure that their values are aligned with their firm's missions and empowering them to do something about it, if not. So I love the fact that I'm still in the kind of corporate world working with professionals, but yet bringing something different to the table. So in some ways, I kind of feel like it's a Goldman social worker, if you will. That's interesting. Um, you said something in the book kind of surprised me that you thought you may have been the only uh, managing director with four children. Um, a female, a mother, plenty of guys. Oh, sorry, sorry. Female, yes. I never met one. She might exist. It's a big firm, but I never met one. Which Lots of men that I knew were managing directors and partners with four kids. How's it going now? Um, being a mother is a real mother as well. When I worked at Goldman, I'll never forget my first day at the office. We had lunch with a partner and who said, welcome to Goldman Sachs, the home of the most paranoid people in the world, because that's what it takes to put up with this environment. And, And even when I was home, even when I would take a vacation day, I was always home waiting for something to drop. You know, sometimes if I had to do something with the kids, I would say I had a meeting. I would drive an hour out to the suburbs, be there with one headphone in my ear, watching dance recitals while dialed into conference calls because I was afraid to be outed as the mom. So it's so great to have a career where when I'm dealing with my kids, my cell phone can go away and I can really be there and listen and exchange with them. That's That's been the single most empowering thing since that's I left. A, that's a great way to end this. And you should be commended too, because you're critical of yourself as well as you're critical of Goldman. Um, so it gives you, it lends everything you're saying, a lot of credibility. Thanks to Jamie Fjord Higgins. Great honor to have her on. And the book is just out, by the way. So we're honored to be uh, one of the first interviews too. Bully Market, My Story of Money and Misogyny at Goldman Sachs. Everybody on Wall Street should probably read this. And anybody in corporate America should probably read this. And I guess I'm promoting your book. Podcasts available, Jim Campbell Radio on YouTube, Madoff Talks, uncovering the untold story of the most notorious Ponzi scheme in history from McGraw-Hill. And uh, hopefully in January, it will be a Netflix documentary. Thanks to Jamie so much. Thanks to our national audience for listening. See everybody on the next edition of Business Talk with Jim Campbell. 